He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. And we're live. Hey, folks, it's the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast with Dr. Philip Ovedia. I'm the, uh, uh, the representative of the great unwashed masses, Jack Heald and Phil. Tell us about our guest today. Another uh, great conversation we're uh, set up for today. Uh, real excited to have Ben Azadi on. Um, ben is, uh, I would say, uh, one of the leaders uh, of the uh, sort of keto uh, movement and really has one of the uh, largest uh, keto communities, keto followings uh, out there. Um, and uh, really excited to just kind of uh, get his perspective on, uh, let's say, the lay of the land around the uh, metabolic health uh, uh, space. Uh, but with that, let me uh, turn it over to Ben so he can uh, give a little bit of your background. Uh, I think much of my audience is probably familiar with you, Ben, but... Um, just, I'm not. Yeah, kind of let us know how I had you to got... look him up. I didn't know who this guy was. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Give, us, so, give us 411. Let's let fix that. How you got here. Yeah. Uh, Philip, thank you for having me. I love what you're doing. And uh, it's an honor to be on your show. So thank you, first and foremost. My my backstory is like so many people out there following a standard American diet here in America growing up here and really unhealthy growing up. I was obese as a kid, physically and also mentally obese. So I was depressed, low self-esteem. I became my environment and I really believe we become our environment. My environment was really toxic growing up. I hung out with the wrong crowd and they sold drugs and did bad things. And that was part of my life growing up. And my parents did the best they, they could do with the, their ability and their awareness. And my parents were divorced and I was pretty much left alone all the time. So growing up, following a standard American diet, I was very unhealthy. My mom actually worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, two of them, two different Kentucky Fried Chicken. So what did she do to help uh, her son? Is she would bring home Kentucky Fried Chicken pretty much every night. And she actually told me, because there were some some nights when she got home where she didn't bring home Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, and I would say, Mom, where, where's the chicken? I was looking forward to it. And she said, oh, I only bring it during the first seven days after they've changed the oil. But after that latter second, second uh, week that they don't change the oil, because they change every 14 days, I don't bring it because the oil is too dark, the canola that they fry in. So they changed it every 14 days. And she only brought it during the first seven days, which is insane. So she um, was looking out for your health. She was. Yeah, there you go. She saw that it turned dark and she didn't want to bring that to me because they were refrying it over yeah. and over. But, you know, as an adult, this transferred oh. into my adulthood. Uh, I was 24 years old back in 2008. And I was going through a really difficult time in my life. I was working at a job that was really uninspiring. I was a manager at a packing and shipping store here in Miami. I was depressed and going through a really difficult breakup. And I had food addiction, sugar addiction, video game addiction, um, drug addiction. And I was filling this void with these bad habits. And I wanted to end my life. I was actually looking for ways to end my life back then, but I kept thinking about my mom every time I explored suicide and it, and it stopped me because I didn't want my mom to deal with so much pain if I took my life. So I knew I had to figure things out. And a, my friend, my best friend handed me a book, a book called The Slight Edge by an author named Jeff Olson. And I read the book and the book taught me about daily habits and how daily habits compound over time to get you your results in life, whether it's good or bad. And I started to understand that I'm in this place, physically unhealthy. I weighed 250 pounds at this time, physically unhealthy, depressed, unhappy, broken, broken, not because this happened overnight or even over the last month. It was a accumulation of all these bad decisions and behaviors that I made over the last several years that have compounded into me feeling this way. So I connected those dots and it helped me understand, okay, if I did all that, which accumulated and compounded into all this negativity, what if I made some changes in the opposite direction and compounded that to a positive uh, progression. And that's where I started to just move my body, started to eat real food. I started to read other books like Dr. Wayne Dyer and, and um, Tony Robbins and Bob Proctor and all these authors that really helped my, with my mindset component. And I took ownership and responsibility. I think that's the first step for great change. And most people don't really understand what the word responsibility means. And to me, it means your ability to respond to life. 
up until my 24 year, uh, for those 24 years of my life, up until then, I was responding very poorly. I was the victim of my genetics, of my enabling family member, of my slow metabolism or whatever, you know, stinking thinking thought that I had back then. But once I took ownership and responsibility, I stopped being the victim of my history and I started to become the victor of my destiny. And I did this transformation in nine months from that decision to take ownership. I went from 250 pounds to 170 pounds. I went from 34% body fat to as low as 6% body fat. And finally, you know, achieved this physical transformation, physical six pack. But the most important thing was a mental six pack and what it did for my mental health. And I started to understand that food directs your mood. And that was about 15 years ago. Ever since then, uh, I've been learning and unlearning and relearning and unlearning and relearning and eventually along the way, I discovered keto and, and fasting in 2013. And I started to implement that, but you know, that's my story in a nutshell. That's how things got started for me, for me, pain to purpose. Like, like you too, Philip, same, similar story, pain to purpose. Yeah. You know, and, um, to follow up on that, you know, what I've sort of become fascinated with is, um, we we've heard, you know, your story, my story, the same story from so many of our guests now and then so many of the people that I talk to in this space. And what I've really started to become fascinated with, and I'd love to hear your perspective on, is so many people are given that same opportunity. They're handed a book by a friend and never read it, never act on it, never do anything with it. And, you know, the people who are successful, the people who take the action and, and you know, correct their mindset and their their thinking thinking as you said you know uh, shout out to zig ziglar there yeah um, exactly you know uh, what what do you think uh is the key and i know you've worked with so many people now uh you know what do you think is that sort of key thing that causes leads you know allows some people to take the action uh while so many of uh so many other people uh just sort of never even try? A really important question. Well, the goal is to change your paradigm, um, which is a multitude of habits that are embedded into your subconscious mind. And I only know two ways to change it. Either it's an emotional impact that changes the way you think and changes your your progression and, and, and it forces you to take responsibility, or it's the progression, it's, it's daily habits over time. So to answer your question, for me, it was hitting rock bottom that forced me to change. I, I had to go through that emotional impact because I knew I wasn't going to take my life. And I was tired of being depressed every single day. I was tired of hurting every day. I was rock bottom. So I used rock bottom as a springboard for, for myself. And I was desperate and I, 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 was, I would try anything. So for me, I had to hit rock bottom in order to, okay, I'm, let me read this book. Ideally, we don't want to have to go that route. We want to be proactive, not reactive. But that's where purpose comes into play. A lot of people are not clear on what's important to them. They lack purpose, or if they know what their pur their purpose is, they're not living on purpose with their purpose. But finding your highest values is so important. The Greeks call it your telos, which is uh, what Napoleon Hill called the higher aim. Uh, and there's also a field of study called teleology, all about the study of purpose and highest value. So that is a very easy, better way, be a proactive way to make a change, to pick up that book and read that book is when you get clear on what's important to you. And then you look at your life and look at the things you're doing and it's not aligned with your purpose. Then you make some changes. I, I believe that's probably the best way, but I'm curious your thoughts, Doc. Yeah, for me, it uh, it's exactly that. It comes back to purpose. It comes back to the why. And, you know, it's interesting how much I find myself uh, focusing on that these days with you know, the patients that are coming to me. And, you know, most of the time you might go to the doctor and they'll be, you know, asking about the medical stuff. They'll be, you know, uh, you know, looking at your labs and reviewing the studies. And maybe, you know, if you have a doctor who's actually a little unusual, maybe he'll even ask you, you know, what you're eating, what you're doing, your activity. Uh, but what I find the most powerful question I ask my patients about these days is why, you know, why did you come to me? Why do you want to improve, you know, 
whatever it is, prevent your heart disease, reverse your diabetes. Uh, and when we really get to that why, and they're really solid on that why, that I find is probably the biggest predictor of success anymore. Completely agree. Uh, Jim Rohn said it, right? When the why is strong, the how becomes easier. It's so important to get clear on your why. I agree. You know, I'm, I want to throw a question to both you guys because the the audience for this particular podcast is a little different than the audience for, say, Joe Rogan. Um, people are listening to this podcast or watching this podcast because they're in a place that they'd like to move from. And once somebody has 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 grasped the you know, what what has to happen to change. Um, they might continue to listen to us, but they're probably going to listen to Joe Rogan. So for both of you, what would you say to those folks who are listening and still haven't been able to either find that why? How do you find the... And, and I'm asking you to, to draw not just on your personal experience, how it changed for you, but as you've worked with clients, each of you, what what kinds of things really help people to to get over that hump, to to break through that barrier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want me to then go, you first? go first. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Well, your environment is really important here because if you're hanging around people who are not clear on their why, who are unhealthy, unhappy, they're broke, they're miserable, they're doing bad things, it's going to be very hard to make that shift and get clear on your why. So I would say number one do an audit on your environment. I'm talking about your friends, your family members, your coworkers, everybody in your life. And I would put them into two different categories. This is what I did. And this is what I teach, teach my students. On one side of the, let's say you draw a line down a piece of paper. On one side, you'll write down the word drainers. On the other side, you'll write the word chargers. And then you'll think about the people in your life and put them into those different categories. If somebody's a drainer, they're gossiping, they're not supporting you and your goals and your mission. You feel drained after you speak to them. You put them on one side of the piece of paper. If somebody's a charger, they support you. You're energized when you speak to them. They're rooting for you. You put them on the other piece, uh, the other side of the piece of paper, the drainer side. And then once you're clear on that, do that audit. You want to spend the majority of your time with the chargers and less time with the drainers. That's going to help make this decision much, much more easier. And then the second thing would be, all right, now that you've done that, you've cleaned up your environment. Now it's important to figure out what your highest values are. And you asked the question, Jack, like, how do you even determine that? For me, it's, it's when I started to notice, I would talk about something and I could talk about this subject for hours. I could go into the middle of the night talking about this certain topic with a friend. I'm lit up. I'm, I'm charged up when I speak about a certain topic. So for me, it's self-development, it's keto, it's metabolic health. These are the things that light me up. For somebody else, it might be, you know, sports or it might be whatever it is, business, finances, but whatever you find yourself energized, like time is just flying by. That's usually a clue that you're in that zone of genius. And that's something you should lean into when you feel inspired versus motivated, because motivation is something that's external that needs to happen to you in order for you to get started with something that's very fleeting. But inspiration is from within that word inspiration is um, something that you are excited about that you're in spirit. That's what inspiration means. So I'd pay attention to those different clues there. And that'll get you down the path of your highest values, I believe. Yeah, I think that's some great advice. You know, uh, my, uh, I guess you could say, technique for getting to the why, and I forget who this comes from, uh, but it's the, you know, it, it's keep going to that deeper level of why. And, and you, you know, I think the, the, uh, uh, statistic is you have to kind of ask why seven times to really get to your why. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at first when you ask them, why are you doing this? And you'll get, you know, an answer that might be a little bit superficial. Uh, you know, I want to be here longer for my kids. And then you'll say, well, why is that important to you? And then, you know, you kind of repeat that a couple of times and then you really, you know, when you get to that why that it kind of takes them a little while to think about and to come up with, I find that, you know, that's the real power there. And, uh, and then it's a, just a matter of, you know, kind of reinforcing that with them 
them reinforcing it to themselves uh, and really making that their sort of personal mission statement. You know, that's the non-negotiable. And, you know, if, uh, and assuming that connects to, you know, making the changes that we are typically trying to get people to connect, uh, that's going to lead them to success ultimately. Let me Absolutely. synthesize yeah. what I hear the two of you saying in, in a way that maybe our, our listeners can use for themselves. So um, on Ben's side with the chargers and the drainers, um, you're going to want to have somebody who's a super duper charger work with you to ask the whys, somebody that you really trust, somebody who you know cares about you your your well-being and do that exercise with them ask you know help me get to the core of my why um does that make sense yes you guys agree with that yep yeah i would agree let me let me follow up on something you said earlier ben that's more uh practical more pragmatic uh, by the way i could go on and on about these deep um um values-based behaviors for the whole show. But I know that there's some particular behaviors that people are dealing with. That, and you you mentioned uh, two things. You said this, you gave this phrase, food directs your mood. And you also talked about uh, the various addictions that you were dealing with. Um, if you don't, if you're not addicted yourself, I guarantee Every listener out here knows somebody who is an addict in some way, shape, or form. I'm thinking of a friend in particular who's a serious alcoholic and drug addict um, and just can't seem to break free. Talk about that connection between food directs your mood and addiction. Yeah, um, I have a different view on an addiction. I'm not an addiction expert per se, but I have gone through it myself and overcome it. I, I view addiction as a symptom of somebody who's not aligned with their highest values. That was my life. Um, the body is going to manifest these symptoms and behaviors as a result or as a way of trying to bring you back into homeostasis, which is getting back aligned with your highest values. So for me, it was these addictive behaviors and it was alcohol, it was video games, it was food, it was sugar. Um, but once I got clear on my highest values, then I, I viewed that addiction, or I should say I transferred the energy I was putting in those addictions to my highest values, to studying health and nutrition, to exercising, to focusing on building the business and helping people. And I view it now as a superpower because there's a lot of energy we put into our addictions. I put a lot of energy, a lot of bandwidth into my addictions. And I was really good at my addictions. I was one of the top video game players in the world. I really was. I was making money at tournaments. I was like one of the top ranked players on online back then. I was really good at it because I was putting a lot of energy into it. But once I got clear on my values, video games were not a part of my value. So now I use all the energy and the bandwidth for something good. And now I use it as a superpower. So I view it as it can be a superpower as long as that energy is harnessed the right way. But food does play a direct impact there with the mood, because if you're eating like crap and your brain is inflamed, you got neuroinflammation, you're eating a whole bunch of gluten and a whole bunch of dairy and a whole bunch of seed oils, it's very hard to think clearly. It's very hard to make better decisions because you're inflamed all the time. And we know that the gut is connected to the brain and whatever happens in the gut happens in the brain and vice versa. So if we're eating all these foods that are inflaming the gut, we know these same foods are inflaming the brain. And a lot of these, these, um, neurological conditions like Dr. Chris Palmer is a perfect example with his research, right? He's busting the myth about these neurological illnesses, these mental illnesses, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, depression, and he's calling it a metabolic condition, a result of poor mitochondria, poor nutrition. So we know that this is very powerful. When you start cleaning up the food you're eating, you start practicing intermittent fasting and doing all the things you teach, uh, doc, and you start working on your metabolism, your metabolic health, it's going to impact your thoughts, the way you think, your, your mental state directly. And I saw that 15 years ago before I knew any of the research. I lived it myself. So I view addiction as a superpower as long as you could harness that into something that's that's good for you in the society. In society. 
Okay, I yeah. you said so much there that I wanted to I wanted to ask more questions about um, addiction is energy directed. Uh, I I just want to reflect back what I think I heard you say. If you're dealing with an addiction that you you recognize as something you don't want in your life. It is your body's way of screaming at you, hey, you're, in, you're, you're pointing at something that's not what you really want. And you can take that as, as a sign from your, your true self, your inner self, that uh, you're not directed towards your, your highest values. But rather than trying to resist, oh, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, whatever it happens to be. If you look at that, the energy that you're pouring into it as a blessing, just it's just pointed in the wrong direction. And then, and then, and now I've, I've, I've lost the, so, so now I've got a new focus for my energy. The energy is good the power and the energy and the focus that I pour into it, expressing the addiction is, is good. It's just the target I'm pointing at. That's right. Yeah. The energy is powerful and the bandwidth is incredible. And the, the ability to even have that sort of energy is a blessing. It's being directed towards the wrong habits because it's a symptom because you're not aligned with your highest values. Once you become align with your highest values. Now you take all that energy, all that bandwidth. It's a gift to have an addiction. It really is because you could, you harness a lot of energy there and you transfer it to something good. And that's what I did. And look, I'm not, like I said, I'm not an expert in addiction. It's just what I did personally. And it's that's a, the it's way a different it. model than I've ever heard before though. I, I I've never, I've never heard that particular model of addiction. We had, uh, oh gosh, Phil, who was our, our addiction expert we had on? uh bitten uh Johnson. Johnson. Bitten Johnson. Yeah, she's yeah. Great. yeah um and you know she she believes there's a metabolic component to addiction um and that if you get metabolically healthy uh what was she she was uh, addicted to cigarettes and something else i don't remember and when she got metabolically healthy that helped um but this is a different model and it's really cool i mean this this seems like the kind of thing that would give somebody hope. Hey, you don't have to not have this energy. <laughs> this energy is a gift. Yeah. And, you know, and, and of course we had uh, Chris on as well, Chris Palmer. Uh, and, you know, I think there's a, uh, you know, it, it's now become very obvious, you know, this connection between metabolic health and mental health uh, and, you know, kind of uh, how uh, the improvements uh, in mental health uh, you know, accompany the um, improvements in metabolic health. And again, it's something I see now over and over with my patients um, and even in myself, you know, and, and I don't really point to any overt addictions that I had, you know, alcoholism or gambling or, uh, but, you know, some of these things were certainly more prominent in my life, I would say, more appealing uh, when I was metabolically unhealthy. Uh, I seem to want to do some of these uh, things that weren't necessarily positive. Um, I would say, you know, I certainly had a food addiction component uh, that is now better controlled with metabolic health. But I like the concept of redirecting the energy. And along those lines, you know, I'd love to hear why, you know, you redirected that energy towards what you're now doing, because it's one thing to go through the changes yourself and, you know, lose the weight, improve your health, deal with your negative, uh, maybe addictions. Um, but it's another thing to then turn around and say, I want to help other people to do this. And so what kind of drove you down that pathway? Yeah. Um, and it goes hand in hand, you know, going back to the conversation here about 
addiction. You know, when you get clear on your highest values, you're going to want to be healthier too. And all, all of that, it just goes hand in hand. It really does. So that, that was my story, right? I got clear on my highest values. So I wanted to have energy and health and vitality. So I started working on my metabolic health and I started transferring that bandwidth from um, bad behaviors to good behaviors. So I do believe it, it works hand in hand. But for me, when I went through my nine month transformation, I said, okay, um, I lost a lot of weight. I got healthier. And a lot of people were asking me about how I did it. So I ended up leaving my job. I became a personal trainer. I did the whole personal training thing. I actually opened up a gym, a CrossFit gym here in Miami for many years and trained a lot of clients, got into the fitness space. But I was kind of treating it like a hobby. I had a lot of fun, but it wasn't really like, this is my purpose. I want to you know, change the state of metabolic health uh, in the world. It didn't happen. That didn't happen until my dad started to get really sick. He had type 2 diabetes. And I didn't really understand type 2 diabetes back then. I kind of just fell in line with the conventional sense and listened to what his doctors told him to do, right? Um, they gave me a grocery shopping list that I would take him shopping every Tuesday to the supermarket, get these foods, fiber one bars, uh, Gatorade zero, you know, all the crap they recommend for diabetics. And I did that for my dad. And I made sure his medication was being used every Tuesday, his insulin, his, his meds. And year after year, he was getting worse. He was getting more weight. His, in, his medications went up. He had to keep changing his prescription with his glasses. He was losing his vision. His diabetic neuropathy got worse. And even so, I was still putting my faith in the conventional medical system. Um, and I remember them telling me, your dad needs to lose some weight to help with his diabetes. And I said, but he's taking insulin. Doesn't insulin cause him to gain weight? And they didn't really have an answer for that. But what ended up happening is my dad had really terrible diabetic neuropathy up until the point where he couldn't even walk to the restroom. And he called me one day telling me that he couldn't walk to the restroom. He was in so much pain. So I picked him up, picked up my mom, took him to the Mount Sinai Medical Emergency um, Center here in, in Miami, Florida. And we gave him, we put him into the hospital, into the emergency room, and they gave him a room. And my dad was really stressed being in the emergency room because he knew that potentially the next step would be amputation. As you know, doc, um, they will amputate the feet or uh, the foot or both feet because they will want an infection to spread and kill the rest of the body. So that might have been in his near future. And he knew that, and he was really stressed in the hospital, which, which, which caused him actually to suffer a, a massive stroke in the hospital. And Philip, I got to tell you, like the doctors didn't even know he had a stroke. I, I walked in two days after he was there and my dad wasn't talking to me. And I'm, I'm trying to talk to him and he's just looking at me and I'm, I'm like, something is wrong here. My dad is not speaking to me. He's looking at me. So I call the nurse and I'm like, how come my dad's not speaking to me? And they had no idea. They came in and they, they, they eventually told me he suffered a stroke and it rendered him paralyzed the entire right side of his body. And then he lost the ability to speak. And he was in the hospital and they didn't even know he had a stroke. So that was the beginning of the end of my dad's life. They transferred him to hospice care. And for nine months, I visited him every week, a couple of times a week. And eventually he ended up passing away nine months after that. And that's what really took this hobby of health and nutrition to a, a pain to a purpose, because I started to really dig into the research and I had a lot of questions. I was really pissed off. And I realized they were never trying to reverse my dad's condition. They were never trying to get to the cause. And he lost his life and suffered as a result. And I didn't want that for other people. I knew that it was preventable. It was reversible. And now the, the same info that I, that I teach and, and write about and speak about is the same info that would have potentially saved his life. So I look at it as this. I was given that mountain so I could show the world that the mountain can be moved. And that's why I'm so lit up because I know that what we teach prevents what my dad went through. And even if you have type 2 diabetes, we could work on reversing it, which is something the doctors never told me to do. So that's where it really um, turned into a purpose for me. That was a yeah. fantastic story. <laughs> yeah, I know. It is. Uh, and, and one that I've unfortunately heard too often. Um, and um, it just, um, it, it, I think it really crystallizes the mission that we're all on uh, to try and make sure that that doesn't continue to happen to more people, because unfortunately, it is something I see uh, nearly every day, uh, you know, happening within our main street, within the medical system. Um, and again, it, it, it's, I come back to, you know, 
there the the system is just so overwhelmed taking care of the burden of disease uh and uh unfortunately no one's asking what should we be doing to get less sick people uh it, it's all about you know efficiencies of care and trying to improve the care and more medications to manage the problems instead of why are people getting so sick in the first place and what can we do to change it uh so um it's always uh, heartening for me to see, you know, people uh, like yourself who are able to, you know, kind of take that view and start asking that question and uh, start helping others to ask those questions as well. Um, so uh, along those lines, what, I, I guess, where did you sort of get into keto, low carb? Uh, am I right that, you know, back in 2008, that wasn't really the approach that you actually use to lose uh, all the weight. Correct. Yeah. So I lost the weight. I lost 80 pounds back then, but I was one of those fit, sick people, right? I looked super fit on the outside, but I was inflamed on the inside, had digestive issues. I had brain fog. So I was still seeking what health felt like. And it took me down different avenues. Like uh, it took me down the vegan path. Uh, I read the book, The China Study back in 2012, back before I knew how to really look at studies and look at the methodology uh, and just understand if a study is good or not. So it duped me into believing that a vegan diet, a plant-based diet is the best way to go. So I went full on vegan for a year and a half and uh, did some destructions to my body. I was doing CrossFit at that time and it was, I was super sore from workout, taking a long time to recover. So it didn't work. And eventually I said, all right, I got to do some lab work. Let me make sure uh, uh, something is off. I feel off. Let me just go check. And some of my markers were off, my testosterone declined, and I, I was inflamed. So that made uh, perfect sense to me because I felt awful and the labs matched that. So I eventually transitioned away from a vegan diet. And then I was like, okay, this is 2013 now. What should I do next? And that's where I got into um, some of the research on the ketogenic diets. That's where I read some of the Professor Noakes, uh, Stephen Finney. Uh, Mark Sisson, uh, who, whoever else was back then, Dr. Pampa, some of the, the beginners back then. And it made a lot of sense to me that, you know, this is a metabolic process, a metabolic uh, process that our ancestors have done. It's nothing new. It's just nuanced, but it's been around forever. And we're designed to burn fat where uh, ketones have a, a, a credible amount of benefits. Back then, there wasn't even as much research as there is right now, but it really was really compelling to me. And I also looked at it in the same uh, lens of fasting because I started to get into fasting back then. So I decided, all right, I'm going to do keto. I'm going to do a ketogenic diet, high fat, low carb. I'm going to pair it with intermittent fasting and I'm going to see how I feel. And I felt great. I felt really good. A lot of the brain fog was going away. I was getting, gaining weight on the vegan diet that was starting to come off. I was performing better at the gym. And it was really exciting to me because I was starting to feel like what I wanted to feel like, which is what true health should feel like. And ever since then, um, I've learned a lot about keto and, and fasting and eventually learned more about carnivore. I know you're a big fan of carnivore and I've learned a lot of things and I did a lot of mistakes with it, things that I wouldn't teach anymore, but I see it as a really incredible tool. It really helped myself. I was helping so many of my students and I love okay. it. And I, I don't you gotta really tell us it. about your mistakes. Yeah. I'll tell you about the mistakes. And I don't really view it as a, a as a diet. I really don't. I, I view it as a metabolic process that we're all designed to go through. You know, the 88% of American adults that are unhealthy, I call them essentially they're in a keto deficiency. They, they need to get into this process. So yeah, I'm happy to talk about the mistakes if you want me to. Yes, because there's folks out here, me, for example. Yeah. Uh, who would prefer somebody else to make the mistakes and learn from them rather than make them ourselves. That's the best way, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll tell you a few. In the beginning, I thought it was, it has to be a high fat diet. And that's because when I looked at the percentages of the macros, like 85% fat, 10% protein, 5% carbs is one variation. I thought it always had to be that way. I didn't realize that, okay, I could get fat from my dietary fat, or I could get fat from my body fat. And a lot of people want to get it from their body fat. So there be, there does come a point where you could actually lower your fat and focus on protein and allow your body to tap into more body fat and still remain in the ketosis. I didn't realize that in the beginning. So I did a very high fat diet for a very long time. And um, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that. I don't think we should eat a whole bunch of fat for a very long time. I'm a big fan of more protein focused approach. So that was one mistake. 
Second mistake is that I went right into it, meaning I was eating over 300 grams of carbs per day, like the average person does. And I dropped that to like 30 grams in a couple of days. And what happened? The keto flu, right? A dramatic decrease in electrolytes and insulin and too, too big of a shift for my body to adapt to. So I recommend a slower, if you're not doing keto now, a slower progression into it, keeping the electrolytes up to prevent those symptoms, which is really key, uh, carbohydrate withdrawal symptoms. And I have another view that might be a little controversial. I know that, you know, my friends like Ken Berry and others might not agree with me. I don't know where you stand here with this, Philip, but I'm going to say it anyways. I don't think we should remain in ketosis forever. I think we should achieve metabolic flexibility and go in and out. And that is the premise behind keto flexing. I, I believe in going in and out. So I'm not 100% keto. I'm 80% probably. And I, I flex in and out. And I think that is the goal for a lot of people. And I'm not why, sure where you- Why do you think that's necessary? That flex? Uh, a few reasons. You know, when we look at it from an ancestral standpoint, when our ancestors had the opportunity to eat carbs, I believe they took it. They, they wouldn't look back at their tribe or whatever and say, we are not going to eat that because we're keto, right? They would eat according to the season. So that's one reason. But another reason is I noticed with a lot of my students- mean, By that, you mean uh, the the berries are coming onto the bushes. We're going to eat correct. the berries now. Yeah, correct. Uh, yeah. But in the dead of winter, there ain't nothing like that. So Correct. Yeah. So okay. they- they went in, in and out. Um, and of course, I'm kind of generalizing here. Um, the second one is that I noticed a lot of my students who were aggressively in ketosis and doing a lot of fasting had issues. For a lot of women had some thyroid issues. They had their reverse T3 increase. They had electrolyte imbalances. So when we actually incorporated some keto flex days, and I should define that. It's not a cheat day. It doesn't mean you go back to your standard American diet. It's a day where you incorporate healthier carbs that work with your physiology to intentionally get you out of ketosis for a day. That could mean some fruit, some people white rice, I'll do that sometimes, but having some fruit and it's still low carb, it's about hundred grams to 125 grams of carbs. So it's still low carb. It's just not low enough to be in ketosis, but these getting that insulin spike in a healthy way helps these hormonal conversions, right? So thyroid, for example, the brain stimulates the thyroid to produce TS, well, TSH stimulates the thyroid to produce T4, which is the inactive form of thyroid. That needs to be converted to T3, which is the active version of the thyroid. What actually helps with that conversion is insulin. So I've noticed with chronically low insulin levels, that conversion doesn't happen efficiently. And I've seen reverse T3 go up, which blocks T3. But with incorporating some healthy carbs from time to time, it helps that hormonal conversion. That's one example. Another example is women who have a menstrual cycle. A uh, healthy menstrual cycle involves progesterone that week before the period. Progesterone is a very important hormone to build. And when you do a lot of ketosis and a lot of fasting, it's, it kind of depletes uh, progesterone. But with healthy carbs, it actually helps with progesterone and helps with that monthly cycle. So it actually helps with the menstrual cycle as well. So those are, those are a couple of examples I could go into more. And I don't know if you want to dive deep in a little bit more into those examples, Philip, but that's what I've seen. Yeah, no, I think they're great examples. And I think it's great points that you bring up. And, you know, I think this is really where it really comes down to the individuality and the, you know, the situations you're dealing with, the conditions that you're trying to improve and where you are on that spectrum. Um, and, you know, uh, what I, you know, what concerns me sometimes uh, with, you know, the concept of, you know, keto flex and, you know, going in and out of ketosis is people will interpret that as uh, they don't need to sort of um, be focused on um, getting into ketosis in the first place. So, you know, it, it's the people who are early in this journey who are not metabolically healthy. And when you say to them, well, you know, every once in a while, you can have 100 grams of carbs in a day. Uh, and that just kind of continues to fuel their uh, carb addiction and or their carbohydrate based metabolism, uh, that they haven't really trained their body to, you know, get into the ketosis yet. Uh, and then, you know, again, depending on what situations you're dealing with there, there are, I think, conditions that being in ketosis on a constant basis is clearly beneficial and, and may be necessary. You know, a lot of the neurologic conditions uh, some, and some of these uh, addiction and psychiatric issues that we've mentioned, you know, I think those do require 
uh, constant uh, um, ketosis uh, to have good control. Uh, so, I, you know, I don't think there's necessarily downsides to being in constant ketosis, uh, but I do agree that there are situations uh, where it may not be necessary and maybe it may not be the best, you know, the most advantageous situation for some people. Uh, and then the trick just becomes, you know, like you said, uh, and making sure that people understand that that doesn't mean that you're going back to a standard American diet. Uh, you know, it's just that you're being very selective about your carbohydrates and you're using them strategically. And I think that works out well for many people. Yeah, those those are fair points. And, and it's exactly right. It's based on, off the individual. If somebody has a food addiction history and you tell them to have 100 grams of carbs, it'll open up, you know, Pandora's box. So there's different ways that I teach flexing. There's that regular way where somebody is metabolically healthy enough. Uh, they've done the work. They put in three or six months of ketosis, which is what I generally recommend when they're ready to flex. But if somebody has, for example, food addiction, then we would flex a different way. We would do it with a, a caloric surplus and a focus on protein for that day with no fasting. So there's different variations of it. And it is based off of that individual. You're right. There are certain conditions that need continuous ketosis in order for them to stay in an improved state. So it's based off of the individual. Uh, I agree with you 100%, Doc. I'm fascinated with the relationship between ketosis and hormones, uh, or maybe a, at a broader level with how our bodies uh, make use of various energy sources and how our bodies react hormonally to those various energy sources. Um, I may have heard it at some point, what you said about insulin uh, helping to make the conversion from T4 to T3, but I don't remember that. <laughs> I don't remember if I actually heard it before. Uh, what other types of hormonal processes can we expect to see affected by switching from the standard types of fuel that our bodies use to ketones and to fat? Great question. Yeah, so the majority of people, 88% plus, are using sugar glucose as their primary fuel source. And that is problematic. It leads to a lot of conditions that Philip talks about all the time, insulin resistance, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, et cetera. So we want to switch their fuel source to a fat burning mechanism, ketones essentially. And we do that by lowering their uh, dietary carbs, increasing their protein and fat, pairing it with fasting, et cetera. That gets them into this fat burning state. So uh, when we think about the 70 trillion cells or so in the human body, those are our two primary energy sources, sugar or fat. In other words, glucose or ketones. When we I, make I, that- I, I, Put a pin yeah. in it there. How do we know there's 70 trillion? Well, I realize you don't know the answer to that, but there's but... 30 to 100 trillion, depending on how big the person <laughs> is. <laughs> so I kind of go in the middle. <laughs> when I see numbers that big, it's like nobody counted that. How do we calculate? Okay, <laughs> back to the back to the hormones. They have counted. They have counted. There's a lot. Um, so yeah, back to the hormones. When you're in a state of ketosis, it simply means you're burning fat, burning body fat. Those fatty acids are sent to your liver. Your liver uses them, produces ketones. It produces three types of ketones. You have acetoacetate, which you could measure in the urine. You have acetone, which you could measure in the breath. And then you have beta-hydroxybutyrate, which you could measure in the blood. I would say the gold standard of ketone testing is looking at the blood, beta-hydroxybutyrate. That's the, the one ketone that has the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier and give the, the brain a, a valuable fuel source. But I'm gonna explain what, what it does from a hormonal aspect, but I believe before I get there, I believe that we're designed to burn fat. We really are. Babies that are breastfed, babies that are born into this world and breastfed are actually in a state of ketosis because breast milk has saturated fat and cholesterol and it helps that baby's brain develop. And the argument somebody will say is, but there's sugar in breast milk and they're correct. However, the baby is really efficient at using the glucose that it goes in a state of ketosis, it actually goes in and out of a state of ketosis. And I have, uh, I have seen three PubMed studies, and I'm sure there's more out there that verify this. So we're born into a state of ketosis. It's very important for the brain, which is mostly fat. But then we wean the baby off of the breast milk 
and then instantly into the standard American diet, and we forgot about this metabolic pathway, keto deficiency. So when you're in a state of ketosis, we know ketones are doing a lot of things. They communicate with your mitochondria. They signal to them to produce more mitochondria, mitochondrial biogenesis. And the mitochondria are very important because they're responsible for producing energy. And there's also an intelligence to the mitochondria. These are the energy production factories of the body. Correct. We've learned it like as the power plant of the cells, right? But they produce ATP, which is our, our the gasoline of the cell, energy currency. But the mitochondria are, are more than just like a mindless energy factory. There's an intelligence to the mitochondria and a lot of diseases and conditions to Chris Palmer's point, right? It's a mitochondria dysfunction issue. So with ketones, it creates more mitochondria. It, it helps the cells produce more energy. When we look at the electron transport chain, and Philip, you could correct me if I'm wrong or at any point, we look at the electron transport chain and we see a molecule of glucose versus a molecule of ketones, we see that glucose is getting us about 32 to 36 ATP molecules. When we compare that to ketones, we see over 120 ATP molecules, which is about 400% more energy. And that is because of the creation of new mitochondria. And that is beneficial in a lot of ways because when you're producing more energy, obviously you're going to feel better, but also it raises your basal metabolic rate. So you burn more calories just sitting on the couch. But there's also a component where ketones burn cleaner. They help the mitochondria uncouple, which essentially means it helps it get rid of free radicals, reactive oxygen species. It helps your cells lower inflammation. So it's a really cool process where you have more energy, less inflammation. And when there's less inflammation around the membrane, now your hormones could attach to those receptor sites, these integral membrane proteins and do their job more efficiently. I'm going to stop and see if Philip wants to add anything to that. Yeah, I, I think the uh, sort of mitochondrial efficiency part of this is real key. And it's something that, you know, maybe people don't necessarily understand. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, one other point that I, I would want to go back to that I think is important uh, also for people to understand is uh, the, uh, you know, you mentioned that babies are in ketosis, essentially, when they're being breastfed. Uh, and that, um, uh, you know, the concept of being in ketosis uh, will automatically make you lose weight or that you can't gain weight when you're in, in ketosis. Uh, and, and it's important for people to understand that, you know, ketosis means that you're burning fat for energy. It, it doesn't necessarily tell you anything about uh, that you can't gain fat or you can't gain weight uh, when you're in ketosis. Uh, some of the features that you mentioned are what uh, make it a lot easier to lose weight when you're in ketosis, you know, the increased energy production, the uncoupling of the mitochondria, which leads to increased uh, uh, heat production and, and raising that basal metabolic rate, uh, appetite suppressant effects of ketones, um, all, you know, make it a great tool for weight loss uh, for people who need to lose weight. Uh, but, uh, I, I think that sometimes there's this false conception out there that just, you know, being in ketosis means you're losing weight and, uh, the two don't, uh, necessarily go together. Um, yeah. but like you said, you know, ultimately, um, it is a tool that our bodies can use and should use. And I think one of the, you know, big issues uh, that we've got into in our modern uh, environment is that most people never get into that state or never, you know, experience that state uh, because, you know, we always have an abundance of food for the most part, and it's mostly high carbohydrate food and our body uh, um, essentially, you know, will burn carbohydrates first. Uh, and again, this is misconstrued. You know, the reason that our bodies burn those first is because they're toxic and we need to get rid of them. Um, and, uh, you know, whereas uh, some of those that are in the, I guess you could say anti-keto camp will say, well, you know, obviously, you know, our bodies prefer it because if you have glucose present, you're going to burn that, you know, and you won't go into ketosis. Uh, so a, a lot to dig into there. 
I want to, uh, I want to make sure I understand because yeah, you both have talked about something that again, I haven't heard before um, that ketones are cleaner burning than glucose. Just make sure I've got it right here. And the reason for that is when we use glucose as fuel, the byproduct of burning that fuel is free radicals, which are inflammatory. Am I, did I, do I get that? Did I get that right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yep. Pretty much got it right. Reactive oxygen uh, species, you know, is sometimes what you'll see them referred to, uh, but free radicals. And that's exactly it. That, uh, you know, burning glucose, when you really look at the, you know, I would say the, the science and the data objectively, um, burning glucose is our last resort uh, for energy, is sort of the body's last resort for energy, and is, you know, as Ben alluded to, uh, the least efficient uh, way that we have to produce energy. Yeah, exactly. And I would say, Jack, um, an analogy that helps people connect the dots with the with the glucose versus fat burning is think of glucose as burning firewood, right? If I burn firewood here in my office, you have all this smoke. Think of fat and ketones as a gas stove, right? It doesn't have as much smoke. It's a much cleaner source of energy. So at a cellular point, a cellular level, it's much more efficient to choose fat and ketones, a gas stove versus firewood, which would create all this smoke. Okay. Very good. And, and I, I can't uh, avoid, we usually don't interject politics, but you know, if you're in New York state, it's now believed that, you know, burning gas uh, oh. stoves are, are horrible for your health. So my comment had nothing again, to do uh, we, with no, no, politics. I know, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just, uh, I, I think again, it's emblematic of, of how we misconstrue the systems uh, at play here. And like I said, uh, you know, cause I've certainly heard many a physician, uh, and, you know, supposed nutrition experts who will say that, you know, glucose is the preferred energy source for the body. And they'll point to the fact that it gets burned, you know, preferentially, uh, not understanding that, you know, again, the body is kind of going in order of toxicity because really when you look at the whole system, you know, uh, before we'll even burn glucose, uh, our bodies will burn alcohol if right. it's present first, uh, alcohol being, you know, even more toxic to the body than glucose is. And so that's actually the first thing that our bodies will burn, uh, if, you know, if it's present in the system. Another way uh, to say that but, is if, if that whole, it's better to, to burn glucose than fat argument is, is accurate then it's better to just drink booze than to eat candy. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much right. it. Exactly. If you follow that logic through. Um, so um, uh, I guess, you know, talk a little bit about how you sort of got in your message uh, to the people. Because one of the things that, um, you know, uh, I think you've done a very good job at is getting this message out and, you know, building the audience that you've built and uh, building, you know, Keto Camp and uh, all of uh, sort of your platforms. You have, uh, I lose, is it three or four books out now? Uh, you know, all very, uh, all bestsellers and very well received. Uh, I'd love to hear your experience getting this message out because again, you were one of the earlier ones uh, doing it, uh, certainly ahead of the curve. Uh, before, you know, keto had reached its sort of, you know, popularity that it has today. Yeah, for sure. That that helps, you know, being being ahead of the curve. If anybody got offended from the gas stove comment, just switch that to electric stove. <laughs> it had nothing to do with politics, just in case. Solar um, powered heater. Yeah, there you go. Switch it to A solar powered. powered heater, yes. <laughs> but the message, um, I've been very consistent, Philip. Um, I show up every day. We use these channels, social media, um, podcast, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, you know, Clubhouse is where I met you, Philip, right? So we use all these social media outlets and I use them. I don't let them use me, right? That's very important. I use them as tools. I, I'm just going to go where people are and I'm going to educate. One of my favorite things to do, and I think you're the same way, Philip, is to teach. Uh, and the benefit of teaching 
is that I have found that when I learn something and teach it right away, I retain it so much better. So it's kind of a selfish thing for me to teach because I'm learning it so much better. So as soon as I learn something new, I'll pull out the phone and record an Instagram story or a record a video and it helps me retain it more. And I just love to learn and I love to teach. It's one of my favorite things to do. So I want to use you know these platforms that we have available to us. And I've been very consistent ever since I, I got into the space, especially when I got into keto 2014. I've been using these platforms. If a new platform comes out, I'll use that platform. I'm going to go where people are. And that's pretty cool because I could reach people. We could reach people all over the world uh, in this day and age. It's a pretty cool thing we can do. Like conversations like this, I'm sure there's people listening from all over the world to this exact conversation. So it's really cool. And it's a way to disrupt the sick care industry. Uh, it really is important to have conversations like this and the work that you do fill up in your book and all the things. It's so important because I've seen it firsthand with my dad and I've seen it mm. firsthand with myself. And I, I know a lot of people could relate to the story of what, what happened to my dad. And I really believe if you treat your health casually, you end up a casualty. And we don't want that for anybody. The stats are awful. You talk about 600,000 plus people every year in America with heart disease. The CDC is showing one in three women are diagnosed with cancer right now. For men, it's one in two. Uh, Harvard put out an article a couple of years ago projecting by the year 2030 that 50% of the population in the United States will be classified as obese by 2030. Uh, the CDC is projecting that one in two children will be born on the autism spectrum by 2032. So we know that we have a powerful message that could put a dent into these statistics because a lot of them are preventable, they're reversible. And I just want to do what I my part to get the message out there because I don't want people to have to suffer the way that my dad suffered and the way that his family and his friends suffered around his suffering. Wow. That's kind of our mic drop moment, I think. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, and I think um, there, there's a whole lot more that we could get into, certainly. Uh, but we try and keep these around an hour. And um, Phil, certainly, Phil, yeah. seriously, can I ask one more? Get question? one more in. All right. Yeah. <laughs> because I asked this question because I think you may be the only guest we've had, or at least the only one that I'm. I'm this fairly certain has gone through this particular situation. If my math is accurate, you're closing in on 40. Yeah, turning 39 in September. Yep. What day on September? Fifth. Okay. You? You're three weeks older than my, my oldest daughter. Oh, nice. Um, <clears throat> everybody who's a male over 40 has gone through this weird experience <clears throat> sometime 33, 34, 35, where the volume and quality of food that we used to be able to eat changes. And all of a sudden we start seeing something happen around our middle. You're the only person I know who was keto at that, who's gone from, who's gone through that middle bit in a state of keto that I can ask about it. Um, what was your experience? Have you had any kind of experience like that? Because for most of us, I remember for me, it was 33, maybe 34. All of a sudden, I woke up one morning and realized something's changed. And I, I, I think what it really was, was just my metabolism had slowed down. And therefore, everything changed. I used to be able to eat anything all the time, everywhere, with no effect. And then it changed. So have you, did you go through that? And you've, and I know you've got a lot of, a lot of clients. Have you seen your clients go through that? And what's been the effect? I have seen it um, for myself. Maybe I've noticed some changes and I'll just make some tweaks, you know, a little bit more fasting, whatever. And it gets rid of like any, any extra fat. So not so much for myself. I've been pretty lean since I went through the initial transformation about 15 years ago. Well, for clients, yeah. And I think the the name of the game would be to mix things up. Every every great personal trainer and fitness coach understands that in order to get their clients amazing results long-term, they have to constantly change up that workout routine. So one week would be high reps, low weight, but the next week would be the opposite, different movements, et cetera. It keeps the body adapting. So I look at the same way with keto and fasting. If you're doing the same 
fasting schedule every single day, it's time to either do more fasting or maybe some less fasting. If you've been eating the same foods day in, day out, I like to introduce different foods. So carnivore is a big tool there. Somebody does experience that stall or maybe some weight gain around that age, like to your point, Jack, then I would introduce, hey, let's go to carnivore. It's a different level here where it forces your body to adapt, changes your gut microbiome, where we just focus on meat. And that's a good way to break that plateau. So I'm always changing things up. And I, I have found that when we change things up, it helps the body adapt and it overcomes those stalls. Okay. We got to have you back because you've just opened a whole no, whole nother Pandora's <laughs> box that I want to go down the road. Down the, I would be honored to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, thanks, man. I love you. I love that you introduced me to, to people like this. I get to ask them all these questions and get smart answers. Great questions too. Yeah, really a uh, fun conversation. Uh, tell, tell people where they can find you, Ben. You could find me on the Keto Camp podcast. Phil was just on there. Um, so listen, start with that episode, Keto Camp, Camp with the K. And then my website is benazadi.com. You could find my books and social media on there as well. All right. Well, we'll make sure all that contact information shows up in the show notes. For Phil Avadia, for Ben Azadi, I'm Jack Heal. This is a Stay Off My Operating Table podcast. We'll talk to you all next time. Thank you. Chances are you wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you didn't need to change your life and get healthier. So take action right now. Book a call with Dr. Avadia's team. One small step in the right direction is all it takes to get started. Contact us at ifixhearts.com slash talk. That's ifixhearts.com slash talk.